Hey everyone, this is Rowan Shaw with Diagnostics Learning, here to make math boring. I mean, fun. You, you can edit that out, right? First, let's talk about trigonometry. It's really sine, cosine, tangent. Now, you might have heard of SOHCAHTOA. Here's really what that is. That's just a way to remember which one is which. Sine, which starts with an S, is opposite over hypotenuse. So it's kind of like this. Imagine you have a right triangle, and this is the hypotenuse, and this is your angle X. So really, compared to this angle X, this side is opposite from it, right? So we're going to call that O. And this side over here is adjacent. It's right next to it, so that's A. So really, if the question asks, what's the sine of that angle? The sine is always of an angle. The sine of that angle is going to be the opposite side length, so whatever that is, divided by the hypotenuse. So if this was like a 3, 4, 5 triangle, the sine of X would simply be 3 fifths. The cosine, let's see, it's AH, CAH, so ka, right? So the cosine is the adjacent, which is 4 over hypotenuse. So that's just going to be 4 fifths, adjacent over hypotenuse. And finally, the tangent, toa, tangent is actually, doesn't involve the hypotenuse at all, just the opposite over adjacent, which is, in this case, 3 over 4. One thing about tangent, if you notice, tangent is actually equal to sine over cosine. So notice a problem might just give you the sine and the cosine without giving you actually the sides and ask you to find the tangent. All you got to do is that. And we know they're kind of equal because sine, remember, is opposite over hypotenuse divided by the cosine is uh, adjacent over hypotenuse. Now if you multiply the hypotenuse to the top and the bottom, get rid of it from their denominator, so that's, you're just left with opposite over adjacent, which we know is tangent. Another formula that sort of commonly comes up is that the sine of 90 minus x is equal to the cosine of x. So for example, if you somehow know the sine of 65 degrees and you're being asked for the cosine of, let's say 90 minus that's 25 degrees, it's really just going to, they're going to equal each other. So if this is equal to, you know, uh, p, then cosine of 25 degrees is also going to be p. And finally on that, a couple other ones that come up sometimes is cosecant. Cosecant is just the reciprocal of sine. So if you know that the sine is 3 fifths, the cosecant must be 5 thirds. Similarly, secant is the reciprocal of cosine, and cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, which also means instead of, you know how tangent is sine over cosine? You could say cotangent if it's easier in some cases, cosine over sine. One kind of identity here is sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. That really just comes from the Pythagorean theorem applied to the unit circle. You don't really need to know about that. Just know that if the question is, you know, what's sine squared of 63 degrees plus the cosine squared of 63 degrees, that's just equal to 1. Now let's talk a bit about probability. Let's say there's two events, A and B, and we want to know what's the probability that either one of them happen. Imagine this is kind of like a dartboard. This area is A, this area is B. What's the probability that your, line, your dart falls in sort of either of them, right? So we want to find this area. So one common formula is that, you know, the probability of A or B, two events, one or the other happening, you might just think it's equal to the probability of the first one happening plus the second one happening, right? A plus B. Only problem is A plus B, then we're sort of double counting this middle, right? So it's like probability of A, right? plus probability of b. This part is counted again. So what we have to do is we have to subtract the overlap just once. Not because we don't want to include it, just because we don't want to include it twice. So minus the probability of a and b both happening. There's this thing called the counting rule. It's just a really easy way to count the number of possibilities of things. Long story short, you just multiply. Let's say you have five ties, three pants, four shirts, and you're just wondering what are all the different number of outfits I can make? And there's a lot, right? Long story short, you could wear each of those five ties times the three pants times the four shirts. So really, whatever that is, you could do five times three is 15, 15 times four is 60, so you know that there's 60 possible outfits. Another example of that would be if they said, you know, let's say you have a four spaces you can use in your license plate, and let's say they could be, you know, any, any letter or digit, then let's see, there's 26 letters plus 10 digits from zero through nine, so really there's 36 possibilities. So it's really just 36 times 36 times 36 times 36. Let's say they say that you can't use the same thing twice. Then you have 36 options for the first, but then only 35 for the second because you already used one thing there, times 34 times 33. So whatever that is, that'd be the number of possibilities there. Let's say you have a jar with eight red marbles and 10 blue marbles, so 18 total. And the question is, what's the probability of pulling out 
three red marbles in a row. Well, the first red marble is, you know, the chances are eight out of 18. But then for the second one, there's only seven left now, right? Because you already pulled out one. So it's seven, not out of 18, though, because there's only 17 marbles left. Similarly, the third would be six out of 16, and so on. Then there's this formula, which is really about combinations. Let's say you have eight books, and you don't care about the order, but you just want to make a set of five of them. So how many possible ways can you select five books out of eight of them total? Well, basically, that's basically eight choose five. So you just have to apply this formula. So here, eight choose five would be eight factorial. That just means, you know, doesn't mean eight, like a lot of people think, an exclamation. It just means eight times seven times six, all the way through to one. 8 factorial over here, the k is 5, so 5 factorial times their difference, which is 3 factorial. And one way to sort of simplify this easily, this is 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 factorial, right? So that could really just cancel, because really, if we, even if we went, kept going 5 times 4 times 3, that would all just cancel with this 5 factorial in the denominator. And then here you're just left with this uh, 3 factorial, which is 3 times 2. 3 times 2 is 6, that can cancel with this 6, so really long story short, 8 times 7, 56, is the number of ways in which you could choose 5 out of 8. Then there's mean, median, and mode. The mean really just means the average of a data set. The median is the middle number if you put them all in order, and the mode is just the most frequent observation. So they're all really trying to measure, you know, sort of the center of the data set. And uh, the median is actually not that influenced by outliers. That's just something to remember that they sometimes ask. The mean is a little more influenced. And finally, there's standard deviation. You don't really need to know how to calculate it specifically. Just know that it measures how spread out a data set is. So even if two data sets had the same average, if one is more spread out than the other, it's going to have a higher standard deviation. In fact, we here at Diagnostics kind of made a rap song about statistics to kind of explain some of those concepts. So feel free to check it out. It's called Beyond Average. The MC School Guy, man. That's me. To be beyond average, you should go beyond the average. Standard deviation, something you should want to manage. If that helped, make sure to sign up on Diagnostics.com to learn some more math and learn to know.